<laughs> All right, guys. Ugh. So what is Memorable Monsters? Memorable Monsters is a 5th edition resource of monsters and NPCs. Um, a tomb of unforgettable monsters or villains for your stories and campaigns. Now, in all openness, this is our product. Yes, um, We're is. using this, our show, as a platform to hopefully deliver inspiration but hopefully some interest in the product for the kick uh for, for the backers, kickstarters so yeah. it's a shameless plug there's no way around it well, yeah well i wouldn't <laughs> say it's shameless i'm not it's, no yeah it's it's something that even if you oh, yeah. didn't support it it'll give you great ideas for building amazing npcs so, well i'd even go as far as to say is even if you ignore the step blocks for fifth edition which is this is being made for mind you it's right. still plenty of rp material to spring off of i was Absolutely. i was really on the fence about whether to do the fifth edition stat blocks and just leave it open to any fantasy setting because you're right that's one of the biggest things is if you take away the 5e stat blocks they're formatted in a way that any fantasy setting would would work exactly which is fan fantastic but it is nice to have the base to go off of to at least give people an idea of how they're supposed to work if yeah. combat yeah. does come up so yeah so and some of them characters which i know i've created a, a couple they they do have very high combative options yes that are, i do like that i'm only so, working on one but i've been thinking with that for the past few yeah. weeks because i am not satisfied i suck at writing <laughs> <laughs> so um for for me memorable monsters is definitely um something if you want more than just a stat block and that's actually one of the, the the selling points is one thing i've noticed anytime i open a page to any of my monster manuals not only are the 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 monsters not unique mm -hmm. there's there's a million uh zombies you know what there's hundreds of goblins there is but there's only one uh yinagu <clears throat> yinagu is that like the, the the big i don't know if it's a deity but Mm. Uh, of the the maybe of the gnolls i said goblins but the gnoll the gnoll deity inagu inagu whatever i'm not sure to be um, honest but the the content of about them and their personalities is very lacking and there's usually not a lot yeah volos did a good job though kudos to volos because that really fo focused more on like the the lore the, and stuff i think it focused more on like the unique monsters as well yeah. not just necessarily like the yes this is zombie he is dead he's going to eat you there's nothing more <laughs> so uh, kind of jumping off of that, what makes uh, uh, Memorable Monsters so great is that it'll have 50 fully fleshed out monsters. Some of these things are like a thousand word um, um, details. Yes. That's a lot. Like three, Some of them are like three pages long. Um, now, that's not for everyone, and we understand that. Right. Um, these are meant to be friends, allies, bosses. Um, quest givers. Yes, quest givers, um, merchants. Blacksmiths. All the, the, the people in the world... That you want to make the and make more memorable, See right? What we did that. Yeah, it's <laughs> something that the characters and the players aren't gonna forget in their games. At least no. that's the that's the hope, right? That's the idea. And and we we've done really. A, we've actually started working on it already. Even though the Kickstarter hasn't mm -hmm. doesn't go live for another couple of days, we have several uh, examples that we've built up um kind of in anticipation of this so everyone can kind of see what we're going for right so with that being said what do you think makes memorable monsters right off most noticeable right off the bat personality personality is good having a solid background and motivation yep I maybe love, even like the way they look i was gonna say i love their the appearance. art yeah i love the art the art is really dope. i know one that he uh really liked uh was one that i've written and uh the guy had uh he's a human but his eyes are glowing red for a reason that i won't spoil of course but they're glowing red like you took that humans can't right? do that yeah without, humans without magic without magic and or obviously he's not thing, right? totally magical but whereas, so whereas like the um with the one I'm currently writing, I kind of was a little bit ambitious, but due to how I'm doing it, I've been kind of trying to keep it broad on purpose, and you know yeah. why. <laughs> yeah. I do. So. And the best part is, like, the short version, I'm basically creating an Assassin's Guild. Ooh. But depending on how it's done. <laughs> he, dope. he took a picture. I told him. He, so I had a picture that has many <clears throat> different characters in it. And they're all, like, a yeah, female acrobats. Said, one. Yeah, I said pick one. <laughs> and then he comes back. I gonna take all of them I'm like wait no that's not how i want it but he made it work so anyways 
So what we have to do now is we really have to tell these. We're estimating this book to be at least 150 pages, so it's going to be a lot of content. Yes. We have some stretch goals. If we reach those, we'll add layers mm -hmm. and short adventures to go with some of the, the memorable monsters to really Could be um, some make cool it ones easy just to drop right into your, your stories and campaigns. Absolutely. I mean, we are trying to make it memorable. So now let's get into it. Let's talk about a few examples. I chose a, a few examples that... Um, we had, if you head on over to uh, facebook.com slash memorable monsters, um, or just type in memorable monsters in the search, or go to our website at criticemmy.com slash post slash episode 181, you can actually download uh, these PDF files for your use right now if you want. Um, this is actually super exciting because I haven't actually had a chance to look at both of these monsters. That's okay. <laughs> so this is actually, super cool. I don't know why. There we go. Let's close that out. Because I've only seen what I've written. I haven't seen what anyone else has written, really. All right. So, and actually, I really like this first one we're going to talk about. His name's Tannis Kiro. Now, this is actually one that was written by Gabe Kleinart. Kleinart of, was that, am I saying that right? Gabe Bra from Inner Party Conflict. Thanks, Gabe. Um, <laughs> can I just say he did a phenomenal job writing this out? Um, so, let's tell you guys a little bit about it. Because there's, I mean, there's. One, two, there's two full pages here of story of this mm -hmm. guy. So let's talk a little bit about him. Yeah. Austin, have you ever seen an albino black dragon? No. Do you ever wonder what happened to the sword that slew the tyrant Bane Tenebris in the Great Orc War? I mean, I would. <laughs> they say the Key of Dusk was stolen centuries ago. Who do you think has it now? Probably the man who owns the... Key of Dusk. <laughs> I've heard that there's a collector. Bum, bum, bum. bum. Yeah. So, Tanneris Caro, um, Tan Tanneris Caro, I keep putting an R in there, uh, began life, like most goblins, part of a horde squabbling over food and pun you know. wonder <laughs> wondering what they could from traveling merchants and occasionally band of adventurers. As they do. They like shiny stuff. That's how they roll, right? Oh, yeah. 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 Um... As the run to the group, uh, Tannis always had, you know, to fight harder than his brethren when it came to getting an equal share. Mm -hmm. He's a tiny guy. <laughs> One of his earliest memories involved a glittering gem found in the boot of a drunken warrior um, the Horde had ambushed one night. Ooh. Cool. And it all started from there. Yeah. So be careful, adventurers, when you're taking a nap. Tannis, disco uh, at that point, uh, he held the gem and it kept him... Uh, I kept it as his own for weeks, not sharing, because that's usually what goblins do, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody's usually in charge, they collect it, and they give it, or they squabble and fight over it, right? Right. <laughs> not this guy. But when his brothers caught hold of it, this glimmering stone, his only possession was taken from him and bartered for food and weapons for the horde. Now, how do you think that made Tannis feel? <laughs> that. Yeah. So, Tannis <laughs> uh, began to, he, not only was he angry, but he started to, to realize he had a, an uncontrollable greed, right? Which, mm. I mean, there's a difference between, like, goblins being greedy and then uncontrollable greed, Like, right? you're going to murder for yes. it. Yeah. <laughs> so, at this point, um, sometime later, a group of adventurers came into the valley. Tannis, out scourging for food on his own, overheard heard one of the adventurers. An elf. Briefly speaking in goblin tongue. Ooh, that's interesting. Why do you think they would do that? It's a great question. Yeah. Yeah, goblin, Seeing goblin, goblin. his opportunity for revenge, he approached the adventure uh, the adventurers with an offer. Ooh. I don't think I've ever heard of a goblin approach the adventurers yeah, and not get a head cut off. Yeah, <laughs> and not die immediately on sight. He said he would guide them to the goblins' secret tunnel and pass their traps in exchange for a share of the treasure. He just wants the gem. He wants wow. the gem. When they agreed, and which what adventure? Oh yeah, not gonna agree, adventure would be right? like, uh, yeah. At the definitely. very least, they might just take him and then chop his head off later, because you know that's what they do. Yeah, because you know, adventurers. Uh, and and actually, he kind of expected them to break the agreement and turn on him. But to his surprise, um, once the horde was dead, they honored their promise, and Tannis was gifted a sack of gold before going on their way. Huh. See, everybody wins. Well, yeah. There was 99 goblins in the tunnel at the time. 99 not goblins in the tunnel. You chop off a head and 
shit. I Go can't. to the next. Yeah. Now, <laughs> now only Tannis next. is the goblin of the <laughs> I don't know. I kind of lost my way there. Um, now Tannis is the only so, goblin instead. <laughs> now, obviously, yeah, there you go. I got it. I got you. I got you. I got you. <laughs> now, there's more to this. I don't want to go through this whole thing, but basically, um, his level of greed came uh, with uh, more than just greed. He learned that he liked tales and unique treasures, antiquities, things that nobody else could get their hands on. He became an adventurer. Literally. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, he is literally an adventurer. adventurer. I yeah. could totally see myself doing this as a backstory of my own character now. Yeah, that that makes sense. That's awesome. I hadn't considered the, the, the player of the Yeah, uh, usage player of using this. Yeah. the backgrounds of Which these fits on memorable what you monsters. were saying that mm-hmm. it's more uh, engaging than some people's <laughs> characters. Um, so what does that mean? So he became this collector of magical art, you know, magical items, art, you know, rare antiquities. Um, and it it goes into more detail, but what we want to talk about is we want to talk about the fact that it offers current motives. So Tannis Mm -hmm. has been doing this for a while. He's, he's, you know, built up a a wealth of collection. Um, he's got a repertoire of stuff. What, can you tell us a little bit about his current, uh, motives? Sure. No, that's fine. I can see it right over there. Uh, Tannis Carrow is always on the lookout for valuable treasures, holding rarity and history above all others. He does most of his mundane business through representatives to keep his identity and location obscured. I mean, makes sense. it makes sense when you're a goblin. You don't really want to show that you are. <laughs> uh, but if someone offers a relic that piques his interest enough, he just might arrange a meeting face to face. So now this is where it gets interesting. His stat box sucks. But the fact that he uses an intermediary as a springboard. Yes. We haven't got to the stat block yet, but I'm glad you noticed that because that's the point, right? Yeah. He himself is not... Not strong. Not strong. Stronger than your average goblin by the looks of it, but... But clever usage of his trinkets and stuff. But what's interesting is the next point. Ian, can you tell us some of the recommendations the, the book gives for ways they can use Tannis as an NPC? First and foremost, he can be an information giver. How would he do that? His home is a museum of rare and valuable relics. He knows the history of each and every one. If there's hidden knowledge known only by a few, Tannis probably knows it. Yeah, so that right there is already a really one use of it. Not as a monster to be kid his head cut off, though. It could, could be. I mean, <laughs> you, yeah, maybe yeah. you have a player that is extremely hell bent against goblins, right? And that, I mean, maybe could he's be just more like, eh, trope, I don't need the information that bad. Yeah. Off of his head. And there you go. What's another way, uh, Ian? As a quest giver. Ooh. Ooh. Though like he's uh, rather unscrupulous in most of his practices, he's always on the lookout for more curiosities to add to his collection. If it's rare, he just might look for someone to uh, be hired to procure it for him. See, now I really like this one because usually the adventurers go out and they find stuff on their own, slain mm-hmm. goblins, <laughs> poor Tannis, um, or, or <laughs> bandits or whatever, and they stumble across magic items. Imagine as a character or as a, a player, a goblin like this walking up to you with an oppor- job opportunity saying, hey, I want this item. It's a value. Well, first of all, they play my players would probably not and would just walk away with it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> but the fact that it puts them in a situation where they have an opportunity to capture an item of value and give it back means um, he can be used as a um, reoccurring thing. Mm-hmm. Because he's constantly looking, if you guys do well, he might end up becoming a, um, a, a benefactor of your adventures. Hey, mm-hmm. I just heard about this. And this is great if you've got the character or the player who loves the, the lore side of the game, right? Yes. Because I can very very well see this becoming search for some of the more iconic magic items mm-hmm. in the, the DMG. And what I like about that, too, is <clears throat> because you know he's already wealthy, right? Uh, if you perhaps say this is like the third or fourth job you've done for him now. Now, he's probably more inclined to actually, because you're such, you know, uh, you're efficient, you keep coming back, and he, he can find you reliable, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> I've seen some players, so maybe not, <laughs> but um, but you can also say, like, maybe he doesn't exchange you just gold anymore, right? Maybe Ooh. he's saying, like, I can help you build, like, a base of sorts or something. Maybe give you guys, you know, I don't know, I can't just get you guys a castle but i know a guy who can get well, you a yeah castle. i mean he's gonna have connections right absolutely or maybe he knows of a monster infested castle 
Ooh. And maybe you can clear it out, and then now the castle is yours. See, that's good too. I like. That. I like that. I like this. So that's that's him as a quest giver, and I already we're all, as you can tell the 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 cogs are kind of spinning. Yeah, they're right already now, spinning just yep. from a few of these ideas. And what's, there's still two more. What's a, what's another one there, Austin? Uh, so this one right here is he can actually be a merchant. So even the rarest items of Tannis's collection can be bought. Though the price may include more than just gold, and if we know anything about more than gold, it's probably a favor. Yes, and that is something that I think leads to more quests. some interesting roleplay opportunities. This guy's goal is to capture rare oddities and trinkets. What kind of favor is he going to ask that he's willing to give one up? Right, like that's... I don't know, man. <laughs> you gotta... that. <laughs> Maybe someone's been up. Maybe there's like a rival. Oh, and that's maybe good. he's like, I need him to be put down. Dealt he has, with. he's, he's stolen something from me that I wanted, and it was supposed to be mine. But now I need you to take care of him. What if the guy's got paperwork of ownership? Yeah. Oh shit! <laughs> he took what I rightfully stole. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's a good one. I like that. That's very cool. The, the idea of ownership of a... Uh, he doesn't have the actual... He has the item, but not the ownership. I never right. thought of that. That could be good. That'd be, I think because then law enforcement have... could be involved. And oh, then, yeah. And, you, and obviously, then what if yeah. the document's forged? And it's a good forgery. Or what if he wants you to forge a document and <gasps> then replace it inside City Hall where all the deeds are? See, oh, there's oh, so shit. much shit. That's a good one <laughs> for... Uh, my, oh, Raven man. would have such a good time with that. He'd be like, absolute, I'm because in. Because now you're talking I'm about infiltration, you needing the forgery skill, which isn't something that sees a lot of Not lot usually, of use. No. Not enough. And then, what if you end up being in a situation where um, your character, let's say your character is proficient in the forgery. I can totally see this coming off that if it is identified as a, for, a, a forgery, mm -hmm. that the the inqui the magisters or the inquisition or whatever group would handle this might recognize that character's signature or his work you know like uh, in all these FBI oh, he's movies done it yeah before kind he's of done thing. it a yeah. bunch right and so now the the good guys are chasing the heroes because one of them is forging documents illegally that could that's a lot and usually it's weird because a lot of like uh at least a lot of campaign settings that I've normally seen, the law enforcement in the game usually doesn't do a whole lot. Usually the guards are just kind of there. You know they you exist. You say that, but you realize my character died by the guards, right? No, yeah, absolutely. Okay. To be fair, I, I believe you put it in advance, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, we were already getting our asses kicked before I decided that, but yeah, okay. Well, that's the point of the um, of that uh, and module. What is it? The, 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 uh, the Dragon Heist, Heist one? Dragon Heist yeah. One. yeah. So, but yeah, you're right. But like usually, like you go to a town... Yeah, you know, guards exist, but most of the time when things happen in the back alley, no one does anything. <laughs> and, oh, this guy's dead in the back alley. Yeah, well, he's dead. I don't, I don't know how it happened. I don't see no blood trail. He's, you know, whatever. Would you uh, add the show notes to the, the, the text? So there's definitely, could be some, a lot of work you can do with that. So, and, so that's only three. And of course, we can't forget the villain right right uh if tanis carol you know wants something to add to his collection he's going to get it maybe he's very he'll do whatever it takes to get it you mm -hmm. know and if a group of adventure finds the ancient relic and the dragon's horde that they aren't selling then they might just run into some quote trouble next mm -hmm. time they make camp so yeah again and i can kind of see that too uh given what we know about tannis's uh character so far you can definitely see that you know he's willing to you know kill all of his allies from previously in his horde and they all literally died i think it can be better than that i think that they could try to move the object from point a to point b and he offers to buy it and they refuse and they refuse um and maybe they intentionally use it for trade or something, or they do try to sell it and they just don't want to sell it to him. Mm -hmm. He blocks all access for them to work with merchants. Maybe a good he, he uses his connections to say, you see these people right here? He has your crows. You don't buy nothing of theirs. So then he's the only person left for them to deal with. Sell it. And then he undercuts them so bad that it's more of a loss than anything else. <laughs> What's up? It's a good one. I just thought of he may, might know about, let's say, a caravan transporting a magical object that he wants, and he lets slip to a, a bandits, if you will, that's being transported, 
and he then hi- hires the heroes to retrieve it from the bandits. Ooh. Hmm. To kind of give that extra layer of plausible deniability. That he isn't involved. I like that. You know what I think would be cool, though? Hey! We, we found this one of the bandits. I, I don't know where it came from. <laughs> we stole it from them. <laughs> they stole it from somebody, so we're giving it to the rightful owner. I think. Who, who is this guy, I think. Or the guy who paid us to, to, to get it. Right, right. I See, there's there's a lot you could do with this. Um, especially with somebody that's so involved in trade deals and stuff, he could really cause trouble outside of just attacking them. And I think that even makes it worse. Um, so and that's kind of the point of the character, too. He's not meant to be confrontational. Right. It, it takes well, work just to see him. Yeah. So... He's kind of like the guy behind the guy. Mm-hmm. Behind the guy. He's the dude behind the dude behind the other dude. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we talked about his current mot- uh, motives, right? Which is basically um, holding rarity and history above, you know, others and his mundane businesses. Um, yeah. We also include long-term motives, right? So this is actually some pretty cool stuff, too. You want um, to see I can say this one, sure. Uh, so his long-term motive for Tannis Caro is, though he has long outlived all of his blood relatives, Tannis knows better than anyone that life is fleeting and time is the ultimate enemy. That's a good Ooh, one. I like that. He has confided this in nobody, but his eventual goal is to find a way to escape death and no method of extending his life from becoming a lich to transferring his soul into another person's body to creating a magical vessel to hold his consciousness is beyond his moral horizon. That is cool. That is very cool. Um, it's It really does sell the whole, like, he's willing to do anything to get what he wants. He is literally encapsulated by the greed that he holds. Yeah. So that's cool. I do like that um, his long-term goal is to, you know, extend his life. In the unique field that he's in of collecting stuff, if, he's, it's, if it's out there... He's, he's going to get it. He's going to find it. And yeah. it's probably not super. I mean, in D&D, there's a surprisingly large amount of ways to live a lot longer. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, pray to the God, druid gods and just, you know, learn to never age. Is that, that's one of the druid things, right? Yeah, I think so. I literally. feel like that would be easier than trying to find a rare artifact. <laughs> Just know. go pretend you care about trees for a little while. Go, the, go hug them. Yeah, go hug a tree real quick and <laughs> yep. you'll live forever because you'll uh, be one with the trees. <laughs> now... No, there. No character would be interesting and exciting if they didn't have something. Ian, what is it? Flaws. Do you want to tell us what his flaw is? A lifetime of dealing with underlings and servants has left them with a feeling of su- superiority to anyone and everyone. Ha! <laughs> he's snooty. And as such, he's likely to underestimate anyone who finds themselves in a position to manipulate him. Tannis's greed is his single biggest motivator. And though he has plans and contingencies for those plans, his greed can always be exploited. And finally, his greed stems from, shall we say, uh, an undeniable need for personal belongings. If someone were to somehow destroy or take away all of his uh, curiosities and relics, he would have nothing left to live for. That's brutal. Yep. So if you just, like, burn down his shop. You can threaten to burn his stuff down. Yeah. I never thought about that. Uh, Yeah, just so you know... We need you to do us a favor. And now I know you're not willing to do it, but hear us out. We have rigged your lair to explode, burning everything in it to the ground if you don't do this. So now he's pissed and he's got to help you, which means he's coming back for vengeance later. What could be cool on that idea is say the players know this, but say you have a bunch of like, um, like a bunch of good characters, obviously, right? <laughs> um, now they Good. wouldn't put the bombs on everything right they nope. wouldn't set it on fire but they could threaten the idea of it they could lie to him about it and he may he may you know be able to see through it but maybe not and all he has to do is believe you yeah or Good if role. you're somehow in his like a lair where all of his like, curiosity were kept a major just when you him saying i know fireball so choose your words carefully <laughs> kaboom yo <laughs> Um, I didn't ask how big the room was. I said I can't ask fireball. <laughs> so you could all and you could also just like to push the point further to like kind of like uh, say like hey like you know you can really threaten him with it as long as you probably just know one of the items that probably is in his stash that no one or that he probably didn't think anyone would know about. Say you probably t- say he had like you know one of his representatives and maybe they knew somehow. Okay. You could do some real interesting stuff to kind of work through his flaw there. 
Yeah, so I like that. It is definitely a flaw. And I think <laughs> that it, because it can be manipulated, mm-hmm. he can be manipulated. And I think that could be not just by the adventurers, by by other people, you know? I wonder how much he would value his own life by that point, too. What would he value his items more or himself? I don't know, man. Some greedy ass people. You ever watch that uh, mummy movie with uh, Brandon Fraser? Or mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Where he has the guy pocketing himself as the place. He's pocketing little chips of scare- golden scarabs while the place is literally crumbling around him. Mm-hmm. So he might be like that. So now, now, oh, go ahead. now, as I pointed out before, his stat block is effectively a CR2 creature. Now, yeah. I feel like nine times out of ten, most players are scared by by a monster just by how tough are they in combat. Okay. As we've seen, however, in the case of Tannis, he has a lot of potential influence that you just don't think about that could cause a domino effect. Yes. Like what? Well, let me give an example. And this will be kind of a spoiler at this point, but John Wick 2 came out in 2017, so it's been Everyone three years be at this point. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite moment in the film was near the end of the movie. John basically broke the rules. He's now oh yeah, like, be, marked by the Assassin's Guild and is hunted. And he's walking through like the park. Winston, the local uh, head of the hotel, if you will, the local branch, if you will, of the Assassin's Guild, they kind of had their back and forth. Yep. And um, it gets to the point where John's like, well, if you guys are so tough, why am I still alive? <laughs> <laughs> and only for... W- only for suddenly everybody in the park suddenly stopped walking and about faced them as, <laughs> as a group and went to just and said, because I allowed it. And That's very much something that this yes. guy I could see yeah. him doing. And I just, I'm like, if I was a player in a game and that happened to me, I'd be like, oh crap. Yeah, you would think immediately, okay, I. How much I power does this guy here. have? <laughs> I fucked up. I fucked up hard. And I, and I gotta do a lot of stuff to get back from where I'm at right now. <laughs> Mistakes may have been made. <laughs> so you mentioned the uh, the stat Very lock cool. being only a CR two. Yeah. What's interesting is, um, aside from being a little buffer than traditional goblins, yeah, his power doesn't come from weapons. No. Um, he has trinkets because that's what he finds, right? So it's only a matter of time before what. He finds magical ones, right? Yeah, yep. absolutely. So he has an ability called Take Your Money and Go. It's a melee arranged <clears throat> attack um, that deals bludgeoning damage, and the target is pushed back five feet away from Tannis. When using this attack, Tannis hits his opponents with a gem or valuable object, leaving behind 10, 1d10 gold pieces worth. Of- he throws treasure at you! <laughs> And not only does it damage you, you can decide to just take it and uh, maybe maybe just leave. It was the worst kind of bribe. Take it! <laughs> Hit him in the face. I love it. That's can a you, good one. Can you imagine it? I can see, even see, um, it's got a pretty big range, so I may imagine him having like a sling or something too. No, he's just that strong. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's just hoofing that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, he also has the redirect attack, which lets him, you know, choose allies to take the hits for him, mm. which is exactly what you would expect from a coward, right? Absolutely. Somebody who oh, values yeah. his life and his possessions more than anything else, right? It's like, I you can't attack the suit. Do you know how much I had to go through to get this? It's made out of dragon skin. Do you know how much dragon skin costs? Now, Austin, I want you to tell me about his last ability, his uh, re- okay. one of his reactions. Let's see here. The Amulet of King's Retreat. Interesting name. When an attack reduces Tannis to below half of his maximum HP, he may cast Dimension Door spell in response. After using this ability, he cannot use it again until after taking a long rest. He just says bye. Yeah. He's he got a get out of town magic item. You just made yourself an enemy for life. <laughs> and how terrifying would that be if he, before he left, he had some sort of threat that he delivered on? Oh, yeah, absolutely. He's just like, you haven't won. You haven't won at all. My influence extends beyond the planes. And then he's gone. <laughs> That's brutal, brother. That's savage. I love it. Oh, my goodness. I didn't even think about the idea where he could have, like, like friends in high places friends in literal high places like angels and demons and devils especially oh, devils shit. especially devils deals. yeah he probably doesn't even own his own soul cuz i can That's... see him selling his soul for and then, an item and then just attempting to live forever yeah so, so he that way he never to... ever has yeah. to pay it back oh shit uh <laughs> that just took a way higher turn than Carmageddon wow. says he's a hope for no... and has used payday write that down for another guy at some point <laughs> 
Yeah. Somebody write that down somewhere. Uh, anywhere. I don't got anything to write with. Um, Facebook. Yeah. It. Open it up. <laughs> uh, all right. So I was actually planning That's to cover two, but we actually got a lot of mileage out of this one. Yeah. I don't, wow. We um, really. We really took our sweet time with that yeah, one and I, I you know what but that's that's one monster and yeah look at all the inspiration that we come from it yeah we, it's literally that easy i don't know now let me ask you guys I mean, making it isn't that easy would but... you remember running into somebody like this absolutely kidding me <laughs> yeah yeah could awesome. you imagine like I, I could imagine if i was playing like raven and because i know i have a bunch of manacles and bullshit to make sure a guy's restrained and he just says bye because he just cast Dimension Teleport. Door, like, at his feet, and I'm just like, Shit, huh? he took my manacles. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, well, I hope he doesn't try to take them off, because those are infused with lightning, and that's really going to uh, hurt. Oh, no, you did take those, <laughs> I did take you? them, so he's going to get fucked up if he did, I guess. That's but. hilarious. Yeah, he's going to uh, be like, yeah, excuse me, shocking experience. get these off me. And the guy goes looks at him, he's like, are, are you sure? He's like, yes, they're manacles, get them off me. No, I, I, I don't mean to alarm you, but... Those are booby trapped, and not like normal booby trapped, like magically booby trapped. <laughs> <laughs> like like kill us booby trapped. <laughs> yeah, like me and you, we will both die. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna. How about you just go to somebody other locksmith? Yeah. Place. <laughs> These locks are booby trapped. Yeah, <laughs> you said traps. Oh, I, I was going to say he said booby. <laughs> that's way better. Uh, all right, I do think that's where we'll call it. We got yeah. a lot of mileage out of that one uh, monster. <laughs> Come again. A little chain lightning. Yeah, ah! that's a good one. How did I not think about that when I made that item for that adventure? I have no idea. I'm let down. How did neither of us ever... How did nobody, nobody notice it? Nobody say that. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, I think that'll do it for our main topic today. Like I said, you can head on over to CritAcademy.com uh, and pick up not only Tannis, but also the other one that is Zindalar Ruthletti who is a Ooh. powerful mage that lost, had his power stripped from him and is seeking the wish access to the wish spell to grant his power back. Oh, shit. Yeah, it's, it's cool. That's cool as fuck. In other words, in this case, for the NPCs in the links to the PDFs, the first one is free. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> like I said, uh, you know, this will have full color illustrations. It'll be about 150 pages. Memorable monsters, we are hoping, will inspire you as the dungeon master as the player and be content that you can drop into your games and make those games as memorable as possible see what's even cool about this is uh you can even make this like as a player like you can base like a character concept off this like yep. it's really They're very this flexible. is some handy stuff <laughs> yeah so uh that being said uh if you if you're interested in this uh, head on over to our Facebook or our website at CraigCabby.com or to our Facebook Memorable Monsters page mm -hmm. and click the link there to follow it. It goes live August 4th, and we hope that you'll support it and want to become a backer and help bring this project to life because it is time-consuming. <laughs> There's a lot lot of details to make sure we get this right. So, Do you guys have any comments on it so far? Nope, that's about it. I'm just curious to see what we're going to put in this thing when it's all said and done. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. We've got a few of the monsters uh, written out and drafted, and they are intriguing. I can't imagine what else is going to show up. Have you seen some? Uh, you get, yeah, you hadn't seen some yeah, of the writing. Seen some of, of the other stuff is really good. There, you, you guys, that uh, the writers that I've got doing this are uh, helping me with this are just phenomenal. So um i think that'll do it for our main topic memorable monsters please back it um on uh, august 4th um if it's successful and we make a full product hopefully if you're listening to this into the future you can go pick it up <laughs> yeah that's what i'm hopefully. hoping we'll see yeah um all right uh before we move on to our honor tips and tricks we have another gift to give away don't we ian we do and, once again, we are giving away, from Jeff Stephen Games, Scourge of the Nightingale, Part 1, A Song of Love. A masked menace terrifies the region, raiding villages to fund her devious plan. Unknowingly, the adventurers stumble into her most recent evil scheme, the kidnapping of a famous performer known as Devon Artis. Their mission is to deliver a ransom and collect Devon. Though, as in most cases, not all goes as planned. First of all, love that adventure. 
Second of all, Carpageddon says you could take the criminal background and Tannis could be your criminal contact. Could you imagine that the amount awesome. of power and influence you'd have over oh, everything? That would be so awesome. Just from your background. <laughs> <laughs> so who's our winner today, Ian? Our winner today is McCormick Luke. Woo! Congratulations! <laughs> you did it! <laughs> Congratulations, McCormick.Luke. You are this week's winner. If you enjoy the product, please leave Jeff Stevens a review. Tell him how much you enjoy the product. Absolutely. Buy the rest of them. <laughs> um, if you didn't win, they don't have to fear, do they? No. No. Never. Because you can head on over to CritAcademy.com slash Jeff Stevens and get Villains in Layers 3 uh, and Encounters in the Cat Savage Seas 3 for free. For free. I right, just click the links and add them to your cart. Or like the Paladins with the Aura of Courage. You'd never have to be afraid. That was really good. I like that. Man. Yeah. Like that, that I only remember that because I'm a paladin. <laughs> Somebody make that a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> now, moving on to our favorite segment, the Unearthed Tips and Tricks segment. The secret sauce of the episode, you could say. Um, Absolutely. Austin. Sure. Would you like to tell us about our character concept? Let's see if it's all on one page there. Yeah, Not quite, but it's uh, close enough. All right. Our character concept is from our patron, Monty. Thank you. The uh, power behind the throne. Seeking the ability to understand the secrets of the arcane, you make a pact with an archfey. Unfortunately, it came with a steep price. Your firstborn child... <gasps> oh, okay, wow, hold oh, on. <laughs> uh, your firstborn child, the memories of your true love, etc. Uh, oh, wow, you like you lose them? Yeah. yeah. Oh, shit. Uh, throughout your travels and time learning your powers, you have... This is getting really hard to see. I'm sorry. Through right, your travels and time learning your powers, you also have to learn the rules of the Fae and the complexity of court politics should you ever function as your patron's emissary. Oh, shit. During your time together, you grow close. Your patron develops a curious fondness for you, and you are wooed by their eccentric nature. As the romance buds... Wow, okay. This is getting weird. Yeah, it's getting real tight. Uh, as the romance buds, your pact requirement is fulfilled. Should the romance experience turbulence, though, chaos just might ensue. Damn. Okay. There's a there's a lot to unpack here. Yeah. There's oh, a. Oh yeah. yeah. There's a there's a quite a bit. Um. First of all, let's talk about the fact that you lose something. Yeah. The losing the memories is a big deal. Do you know why? Memories define characters. Oh yeah. And it's hard to get those fucking things back. Um, in the like really hard. In the Stormlight Archives, um, there is a character who I'm not gonna say no names because I don't want to spoil it because the shit's amazing. Mm-hmm. Who, an event that happened wrecked him so badly, he basically will or sought out a deity to remove those memories. And what's interesting is how bad it changed his characters when he his character when he gets it back oh yeah it was such a traumatic experience that when they come flooding back completely destroy nearly destroys him oh jeez um, and characters and people are were made from our experiences no yeah absolutely so losing something could be a big deal what's crazy is uh losing the Memories of, like, a loved one and then having this romantic relationship with this Archfey is a really scary road that, uh... Yeah, they're not, like, related, are they? Because that would be weird. Especially since Fey are known to be pretty tricksy and various lore here and there, too. Or yeah. simply ha have not the same understanding or concepts that regular mortals have. Oh, God, this is getting gross. Yeah, okay, it's so it's all sorts of way out there. Yeah, don't... Make sure your, your table's okay with that sort of weird-ass shit. Um, I like how you filled in the blanket. I didn't even say anything. <laughs> yeah, that's... Yeah, no, we get it. Mm -hmm. um, no, I'll, no, I think you do. <laughs> are we not talking about the same thing? No. Oh, well, okay then. Then I didn't get it, because I'm... Never mind. Anyways, Ooh. I think this is really cool. But I think this would be cooler to describe your current character. So, let's say I'm a high elf. And sure. I'm an eldritch knight. Right? Okay. Maybe... I lost my memories that made me a full-blown caster, and I used to be a blade singer. Okay. So I used to be a different style of combatant, but because the character lost those memories, their style in combat completely changed. So now anybody they meet or uh, run into may remember them as a blade singer, want to know why the hell they can't fly, 
or why they can't, you know, do the blade song mm-hmm. or why they don't have access to basic evocation spells because all they can do is like defensive shit, right? Yeah. I think. Yeah, and then now he has this like sword that's like hyper bound to him and it's just like Poof! it's in his it. hand. <laughs> See, that to me could be a great way to Tying it in mechanically is definitely, like, the part that you could really run with this. For sure. Because, sure. yeah. like, you can... Because the, the cool thing is you were at one point someone else, possibly, right? Yep. And then now you are effectively someone else because you've lost these memories that defined a moment for you. Yeah. I'm, I'm about to lose some serious nerd cred because Carmageddon says this could be, like, the second never-ending story. All I know about that is the guy loses his memory. I don't know anything about it. Oh, he's left for his movie. Yeah, so. Sorry. Um, sorry, we're not cool enough. Yeah. I do want to see that, though, because that's definitely feel like something. Because I loved uh, um, the stupid puppet thing, the the Dark Crystal. Some mm. good shit. So I bet it's a lot like that. Anyways, I think this is a cool concept. Um, I like Make it. sure it doesn't get too weird. Mm-hmm. Um, Archfey do weird things. Yeah, so. All right, that'll do it uh, for our character concept from patron Monty. Thank you so much, Monty. Yeah. Our monster variant today is the Fright Morph Ravager. Fright Morphs are rare and savage spawn of doppelgangers. Limited in their mental capacity, they act almost purely on impulse. The little mental faculties they do possess focus on seeking power and influence through their violence and treachery. The Fright Morph's inability to master its shifting abilities limits its form to a variety of goblinoid creatures. That's some wild stuff. Yeah. Um, so we, cool. for the origin stat block, you're going to start with the bugbear and you're going to lose the brute feature. And the new features you're going to give it is the shape changer, um, but you're going to limit it to a goblin of uh, medium or smaller size, right? So it could be a bugbear. It's a goblinoid, right? Could be a so. regular goblin. Could be any other. I can't think of any other off the top of my head. But, I don't know. Either. Um, basically, it's stuck in these different, but it can shapeshift between those forms. You're going to give it, because it fights with such primal ferocity, you're going to give it the barbarian rage feature. Heck yeah. Which is one of the reasons why you had to get rid of the brute, because that's going to add damage, right? Right. Um, and then you're going to give it a uh, legendary action called bamboozle. The fright morph ravenger moves up to half its speed and takes the hide action. Now, hmm. I don't know if you know about the, the, the bugbears, but it has a... Uh, uh, like a, a, a feature, if it gets the jump on you, uh, it does a little bit more damage. If okay. I'm, if I remember right. I think that's what it is. Um, this, to me, was sounded really fun. I love the idea of a doppelganger who isn't smart and doesn't have telepathy, mm-hmm. who can shift and pretend to be stuff, but at minimal capacity. Right. What do you guys think? I was expecting, like, a... Uh... Like a frightening feature or like a frightening presence or something. Ooh, that's a good idea. Because I didn't, I was like, when I think Fright Morph, because I don't know what these look like, obviously, uh, considering I have no idea. Well, they, they said doppelganger. You know, a doppelganger mm-hmm. looks like, like a shadowy person. Sense. Yeah, so I was thinking like maybe it's supposed to like inspire fear into like something, but uh, I mean, otherwise I like it. I like it a lot. Add Frightful Presence to that. Because uh, that was... Uh, that's a good idea. Because I was just thinking like it's supposed to be like this... Uh, this ferocious, like, intimidating creature. And I thought, like, Frightful Presence would be a good one. No, yeah. I agree. And I, I have now good. added that. Yeah. Because I don't think that there would affect go. its balance at all. No, so. probably not. What do you think, Ian? Frightful Presence only, what, one turn? Or yeah. something like that? Unless you say it, so. man. Oh, a little shape-shifting can go a long way. <laughs> Especially when somebody knows what they're doing. Unfortunately, this is a creature that may not be that type of creature, but still interesting yeah. nonetheless. <laughs> uh, I can see Tannis hiring, hiring you guys. Because this bastard is impl- uh, imitating him. <laughs> this ruffian is yeah, imitating him. I never thought of that. That'd be hilarious. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, all right. That'll I do like it, it for our monster variant, the Fright Morph Ravager. Pretty cool. Ian, would you like to tell us about our encounter of the podcast? Our encounter of today's podcast is a glowing recommendation. Ooh. As a reward for the party's efforts in her town, the vibrant Ellie Jo Bell Sparkle Gem... Yeah. Lawful good, female, no, writes the characters a letter of recommendation. See the Marks of Prestige section in Chapter 7 of the DMG. Yeah, wasn't okay. gonna write, wasn't going to write all that shit. No, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And suggests they present it to any forgotten folk, alchemists, or merchants should they find themselves in a town or hovel with one. Do you know what a forgotten folk is? No. You're going to tell us anyway. I am. It's the name, nickname for the gnomes. Didn't know that. I just I didn't that. know that either. Okay, well, cool. So the more you know. So what happens, Ian, when they present this letter of recommendation? 
you now have friends in low places. <laughs> because they're short. <laughs> no, I got it. It was just terrible. I like that. And they also have a treasure. <laughs> if the characters seek them out or stumble across a Numish merchant or alchemist, the characters are given a special and unique Numish creation. Oil of Sharpness. Ooh. A special gift to help them in their battles. Temporary plus three to damage and attack? Yeah. That's pretty good. That is pretty good. Yeah. What's funny, though, is because she doesn't tell them what it does, if they don't make no effort, yeah. they don't get it. Yeah. I'm all about options. Take it. And consumables. You don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. And consumables. Oh, yes. Which is where I'm like, I like rings. I like rings a lot. Rings Do you are like cool. burning rings of fire? I tend to. You go down, down, down. <laughs> To the ring of fire. Wow. To the ring of fire. That was really good. That was really good. I like that. So what do you guys think about this? Uh, I like it. Um, I like the idea that we're using a not often seen race, honestly. Um, I don't feel like a lot of gnomes are presented enough in the Forgotten Realms. That is true. That's why I picked it. Yeah. Actually. That's why it's good. That's why I like it. Um, and I also like the uh, marks of prestige uh, add-on. Mm -hmm. um again another thing i feel like we don't see enough i i like anything that can give uh like a, like uh forms of like i don't know just things that you can like hand off to like players and like be like hey this is something like unique that isn't just a weapon or a potion or a you know armor or something like this is something that can help you for later like a something or like a like a letter of passage or something like that. Something titles. Yeah, exactly. Something that can add like even more role play and can still give something mechanically. Yeah, I agree, one hundred percent. I could probably do better. Yeah. 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 We'll see. Yeah. Uh, all right. Still uh, good. I do like you have it. any comments on this? Nothing that I have not already said. All right. I think Fair. that'll do it for our encounter of the podcast. A glowing recommendation. Woohoo! Austin, would you like to tell us about the magic item that is really big here? Do I need I, to blow this up for you again? Nah, like, just turn it. The hard part is just trying to see like the words over there because it kind of distorts the further it goes over, but it's fine. I gotcha. There, that looks great. All right, so we have the magic item from our patron, John. 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 No, John. John. Oh, really, John? Yeah. John well, Gemstone. Cool points for not knowing John. Sorry. Well, I only knew, I knew the last name, but I didn't know the first name. I'm sorry. Please don't hate me. You hate to. We love you, John. Uh, it looks like the magic item is the, oh boy, Nakshira the Tide Curler. You're an anime fan and that's the best you got? I don't... What do you want from me? <laughs> I'm bad with names. Me too. <laughs> I figured I'd heckle on you and pretend a superior point, but I'm, I'm not. That's why I wanted him to take yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, so it's a weapon, any sword. The Tide Curler. That's cool. That is cool. It's a, again, any sword. It can be a long sword, short sword, great sword. It's very rare, and it's a crystallized bronze with tarnished gr showing waves crashing along the opposite the uh, along opposite the edge. Let me try that again. What? Uh, crystallized bronze with tarnished showing waves crashing along opposite the edge. That is a wild sentence. Uh, <laughs> Don't look at me. I didn't write it. I know, it's, it's okay. <laughs> Uh, barnacles ornate the hilt while seaweed is wrapped on the handle. I like that detail. I like that a lot. Uh, you have resistance to fire damage while you hold this weapon. Yay! Fire damage. Not good for everybody. Uh, the weapon has eight charges. While holding it, you can use an action to expend one or more of its charges to cast one of the following spells from it. It's a save DC of 15. You can cast Shape Water, uh, Wall of Water, which is five charges, and Watery Sphere, which is eight charges. Uh, you can use a bonus action to speak the wep this weapon's uh, command word, expending two charges, and a tide of rippling water erupts from the blade. While the blade is coated in this tide, it deals an extra 2d6 cold damage to any target it hits. The tide lasts for one minute or until you drop or seed the sword. Uh, and then there's a little bit more here, and the sword regains uh, 1d6 plus two charges daily at dawn. If you <laughs> expend the last charge, roll a d20, and on a one, the weapon becomes clear like water and splashes the ground, and it is destroyed. Uh, That's cool. I right. spend all the charges. This is a very long weapon <laughs> it's not really though that's yeah, the thing it, it, yeah there's a lot going on yes that i agree but some weapons like they got entire pages of this and then i yeah and this isn't this yeah. isn't that bad but um 
There's I like a lot. This. It's cool. We've I got a like fire brand. Flavor. We've got or we've got a flame tongue. We got a frost brand. We've made the storm sword thing. I forgot what it was called. Yep. Now we have the tide curler. We're gonna get all the elements eventually. Eventually. Now it is worth noting that all these spells are in the Xanathar's Guide. So if you're planning on including it in your game, just know that you can mm -hmm. probably change it with um, the first one being like uh, frost bolt or whatever the the ice attack is or change it with something else. Something else, else yeah. Something water themed, ice themed. So it is interesting though that it potentially has a chance to be destroyed in its last most powerful spell uses all its charges. Yeah, that's something I know is right off the bat too. I'm like, what? But that's mm. actually a common um, trend in the DMG for magical staffs. In 5th edition. In 5th yeah. edition. That's kind of cool though. I would assume that would be just the default setting we're talking about since our show focuses on 5th edition. I'm just saying in the past. <laughs> yeah. Did Interestingly they not do that enough, uh, the sword does not give any like plus ones or anything like that, nope. which I don't think it needs it. Keeps it. it that probably keeps it within the very rare rating. I think. Yeah, because like if it had like plus it one, it might. Bit. Yeah, you could probably give it plus one. It probably wouldn't break it too much, yeah. but giving it like plus two or plus three, that would definitely. Probably. I love the flavor. It. The flavor Flavor's is good. really nice. I can easily envision this blade in my mind. Mm -hmm um as a cutlass or now it's worth noting that when he sent me this aside from the flavor text it was not close to the right format so i did have to go reword it and stuff yeah. um to try to make it fit because i like to just keep it no yeah for sure written. but i love this item i thank you so much john for submitting it do you have any comments on this it has a lot of versatility to a character and uh yeah that definitely can create a um Oh crap! Button if you want to get you out some situations. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I honestly like the idea of the resistance to fire damage. I don't feel like there's really enough weapons that actually offer some form of defensive property. So I think I that's actually that a statement. very uh, a very cool nice thing. Little touch. Yeah, which is probably why it doesn't give like the plus one or anything because you're actually getting a lot. Uh, a lot more from like resistances and stuff yeah. of other things rather than just and the these raw spells damage. are powerful i think this is uh, the shape water i think is first level the wall water's third i think the watery sphere is fifth level so there's some pretty yeah you're getting some stuff there. with it fourth fourth level okay. fourth. still that's still really good um especially it requires no spell casting skill yep so you a fighter just can use, use it this. yeah so um really great weapon thank you john i want to imagine they're like for, like, the fireball that's come at them, they kind of just, like, hold the sword above their head, and it's just, like, raining on them nonstop. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> so, like, they, the, the fire can't reach them because they're just constantly soaking wet. <laughs> that's that's funny. There was a... Uh, I feel like there was a... Did you guys ever watch that uh, uh, Ghost Rider movie? One of the no. villains... <laughs> one of the villains is, like, a uh, water elemental. So he's just always soaking wet and it's running down. And dripping down. <laughs> That's kind of what I envision when you're holding this thing. You're just like soaking wet all, all the time. time. Walking, leaving little puddles everywhere. <laughs> Alternatively, I guess if you didn't want to just be constantly drenched in water, you could just say like you smash the sword into the ground and like a watery like wall comes up or something. And you I can, like it. You could be a... Or you could just cast wall of water. Or you can just cast wall of water. <laughs> you know <laughs> i got it i yeah. got it it's good stuff i do like the i like the flavor of that either making a wall or maybe um a thin layer of water coaching yeah building it to give you that resistance something that because like again you know, like it's not just a weapon you can definitely like flavor it up a little bit so that way it's like well how do i want to tailor this to my character my character's supposed to be really edgy and cool oh, i'm just be walking around all wet all the time well you can you just got to find it out dark water dark water there you go <laughs> it used to be a good cartoon Did you guys ever watch that it was good stuff. yeah it's old pirates and like ooze that lived in that was on the surface of the water i'm gonna like grab pirates and pull them to the it was awesome sink oh my ships god it was awesome <laughs> it's really cool uh, all right that'll do it for our magic item the nakshira the tide curler thanks john yep thank you john our dungeon master tip also comes from patron monty Ooh. Marks of Merit. In Patrick Rothfuss's The King Killer Chronicles, the protagonist gives his great performance at a renowned tavern that earns him his talent pipes, a silver pendant uh, in indicating their status as a performer. Okay. Marks of Merit can be highly underutilized in games. A bard earns their talents, a wizard earns their arcane focus, a fighter earns a unique scabbard, I like that one, like etc., um, these may not provide any inherent mechanical benefits, but they do, however, create interesting role-playing moments. 
and in offers a great discount if a bard plays or uh, institutes of learning allow um, a wizard to access to more restricted areas to research something or maybe a fighter can get in somewhere to get access to special equipment that's like bar orders or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was actually a book that was uh, I only read a little bit of it but it was about 10 years ago um, what they did it was about like a, a society of humans because there was like some extinction thing that was happening um, and they had like their own uh, almost like Similar to like these like talent pipes, but like it was almost like more of like a rite of passage, I guess, mm-hmm. where they would uh, take a like a uh, like a knife, and depending on how many scars you had on your arm, determined what you were good at. Huh. So like if you were particularly good at like uh, um, say you were like really good at like uh, athletic feats, like you were really strong, you could run really fast, you could go out and scavenge really easily, they would have like three marks on you. And if you were, like, particularly good-looking, you'd have, like, eight or some shit. It was wild. But it was That's cool. Intriguing. Yeah, I like the idea that um, that you would... Uh, or, in this case, like, you know, you could... Maybe they would give them, like, some form of badge or something. And, like, that's how you immediately determined who someone was. That's cool. Although not quite the same thing. What jumped to mind for me is the um, Wheel of Time series. And what was kind of a ongoing trope throughout the entire series is if a character's sword had herons on them, that denoted them as a blade master, if you will. Ooh, that's cool. And the one of the main characters, he was given his old father's sword and didn't think anything of it, but turned out that there were heron marks on it. Yeah. Huh. So that kind of made you go, um, what did his dad do in the past exactly? That could lead to some interesting roleplay and that like idea, that. too. And there was also the fact where he didn't know how to use a sword, but a few s- situations were diffused when he got into a game, like some problems, but then people saw the sword like, you know what, I- I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> That's another way for you to use like your roleplay. Say, like you're, in this case, your fighter had like a really unique scabbard, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe they do, like, uh, there's supposed to be some, like, uh, some small encounter. You know, that yeah. maybe the DM had set up. But then um, you realize that you're in a town that knows what this scabbard means very well. And you could tell that to your DM. Maybe they lost track of it. And say, like, it's just like a scuffle. Like, it's a couple bandits or something. Um, and you walk in and, you know, you you see these people, like, getting mugged or something. And, you know, the, the fighter walks up and he's like, I think you guys need to stop. And the guys look over and they're like, oh, what? And then they their eyes dart at the scabbard and they're like, oh, 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 uh, 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 hey guys, didn't we have something else to do? That's how, that's how it is a lot in, uh, in the, the, the Stormlight Archives when, um, if a person has a shard blade, mm-hmm. you just, you don't mess with them. Yeah, you, just, you have they'll, something. They'll cleave you... your spirit right from your body. So they, yeah. there's an amount of clout. That comes with just having one where people just... They won't even mess, they with, won't you. Even mess with you. Because they, you hold so much power over them by that point. Like, yeah. well, who would want to right. is the thing. Who is, like who is ballsy enough to even attempt that? See, for me, um, I could see fighters having, like, a, a set of necklace, necklaces. Uh, or, like, an emblem to, or something, maybe. So yeah, something emblem on their shoulder or something. Something that identifies them. In uh, Fairy Tale, the anime, they do that, yeah. right? they have, like, all tattoos the, All and the, stuff, the right? people have the tattoos. So when people see the Fairy Tale symbol, they know you don't F with that guild. Not only are they crazy, but they're powerful. Um, mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of clout that comes with that. Especially crazy. Especially yes. Oh, <laughs> uh, this is a really dog good one. Dog tags are like a good one too. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. what I was thinking for fighters, like a necklace dog tag or something. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that that you could even do color coding. So let's say um, your your player in your game is a fighter. The silver one kind of shows what tier they're at, and then yeah. when they get to fifth level, they get you know gold like a ones gold one or, or something uh, electrum ones that you know and and kind of represents their power. That was in uh, over Overlord. Overlord was like that, right? All the yeah. adventurers had yes. dog tags yep. that had different were made out of different material that showed how powerful they were. Or another example is the Wheel of Time with like uh, Khal Drago, for example. They point out the fact like he has a lot of braids in his hair. Yeah, what's a big deal? Well, with this culture, every battle that they win, they tie a new braid to their hair. Look how many braids he has. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also worth noting that if they uh, lose a battle, they cut their hair off. Look how long his hair is. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's, That's cool. cool. I like that. Yeah. 
a great character concept right there. That is. Um, cool as that'll do it. That'd be a good one for a barbarian. Absolutely. Um, that'll do it for our Dungeon Master tip. Uh, Marks of Merit. Thank you, Patron Monty, for that. And our player tip of the podcast is... Don't, don't be a dick. dick! Reimagining your character. It happens. You've played your character for a while, and suddenly a new book shows up, offering many new possibilities. Options you might have picked up um, uh, had you known about them earlier. Mm -hmm. Don't despair. You have a few options. Did you know that? You have a few options? Yeah. Yeah. Many classes have rules for allow changing out some stuff when you level up. Uh, Meta magic one, invocations Mm -hmm. I can think of. I think prepared spells for paladins as well. Yep. So there's uh so if retraining won't do the now sometimes that doesn't work and, and not no, everyone yeah, has for that. Sure. So if retra- retraining won't do the trick uh fast enough or if it's not possible at all, uh talk to your DM and your fellow players about reworking your character with some new options. In most cases this should be fine. I don't think that very rarely is it a big deal. Now what you can do if your DM really decides not it's not a good idea, run your character off a cliff. Gotta make a new one. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's literally the next line. Nice job. Is it really? Yeah. Oh, okay. It says, if doing it ultimately proves difficult, a dramatic exit for an older character makes way for a new one. I guess that works. I mean, like, if a new archetype comes out and you really want that archetype. Yep. Yeah, so, sometimes that is what it takes, though. Maybe you can say, I mean, obviously you don't have to go out by going off a cliff, but uh, maybe they're, like, maybe your character is, like, I'm thinking of Zorax right now. Maybe he really is just, like, uh, I have to prove my worth and I'm going to go fight this dragon. Well, probably he's not going to win against that fight against that dragon. So, effectively, I have to make a new character. I make a new character. Or maybe Zorax takes an arrow to the knee. He already did. <laughs> or four. Yep. I don't know about four. I'd rather not take four. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, well, so... I do want to make note, note, though. I realize this tip is uh, more geared towards mechanics, if you will. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I do feel like there are times where, even from a role player background standpoint, that might come up too. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that because there's good backgrounds that have big influence. Like uh, I could, th- like for example, I remember one time where we I played a superhero RPG in the past. Mm-hmm. One player basically played a c- character who was kind of nuts. One player basically c- played a character who was an anarchist, <laughs> and one guy played a hero who was kind of a thug. But and then I came up with my character, who was a time traveler from a post-apocalyptic future trying to prevent World War III. It's like, wait a second. <laughs> Didn't quite fit, huh? Yeah. I can definitely see where that would be yeah. an issue. Um, I would say use caution. If you're changing your character too often, yeah, that starts to look more like you're just trying to get an advantage versus I really would have rather had this option. But then again, right. nobody, I mean, if you're not having fun, I mean, there's always that possibility no, too. No, so. for sure. Yeah. All right. It really does depend on, like your group as well of course yeah. i mean like as me, with most I'm, of our I'm pretty players, lax, but... but i know some dms aren't like that so yeah i don't give a shit it's our game not my game and if yeah. you're a dm and you think otherwise you're a buffoon yep fight me. truth <laughs> all right that'll do it for our player tip of the podcast don't, don't be a dick. dick and you can avoid dickitude by reimagining your character well this has been a really great episode i've had a lot of fun agreed as always We hope you'll join us for our next episode where we discuss artificial intelligence dungeon masters. That sounds fucking dope. It is. Robots are taking over D&D now. I'm I'm on it. I'm I'm in it. it, Whatever. some good stuff. If that means none of us have to DM, we can all be players. By all means, let the robots take over. I'm down. Let's do it. Yeah. It could be fun. Honestly, I could see because like AI comes up with some weird shit sometimes. It's been going for a while, so it's learned a lot. Well, okay, well let's save our conversation. No, yeah, yeah, I guess that's a good idea. Once yeah. we start now, we might as well start straight yeah, in the next yeah. episode. <laughs> uh, if you have any, sorry, if you have any feedback uh, on our tips and tricks or topics you would like to discuss, please send them to us. You can email them to us at critacademy at gmail or you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and a lot of other places at Crit Academy. We're also on a, like a lot of podcast uh, catchers, catchers, all of them, Most and. Of them. Yeah, I think a good chunk. Unless there's some obscure ones we don't know about, but we're definitely all over the place, so you can find us. <laughs> we're, we're like we're like cockroaches. You can't uh, kill us. That's much nicer than what I was going to say. Good. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed your t- experience here at Crit Academy. If you did, you can help others find the show by leaving a hopefully five-star review on iTunes or your platform of choice, or you can just send us a message telling us how much you enjoy the show. 
Also, be sure to give us a like and a share. Please do. Yes. Um, they're currently, right now, at this very moment, um, if you go to our Facebook page or our Twitter, we are trying to reach some milestones between those, and we're giving away loot. So um, if you want to help our Crit Nation grow, go over there and um, comment on those posts and retweet them and, mm-hmm. and invite your friends. We hit some milestones. We're going to let people you know, get some fat loot. So Absolutely. Um, I'm really excited for the Kickstarter. Um, I really hope that you guys had as much fun today as we did um, and will want to back this. Uh, a lot of, I cannot believe how much work has gone into this and it hasn't even started yet. Right. Um, it's so crazy. It's, it's all the preparation for yeah, it. It's yeah. a lot. Um, so I do want to give, once again, a huge shout out to Lure Smith um, and Nord Games. They have been awesome. They've been meeting with us so we can talk and get on the straight and narrow to do this right. Mm-hmm. And I want to give a huge shout out to my wife because if it wasn't for her, it would be a lot more work on me. She really has taken a huge load off my shoulders. So thank you, Empress. I love you. Now, make sure to subscribe to our show at CreekAdmin.com. Follow us on Twitch and YouTube. And please follow us on YouTube. Let us get to that 1,000 goal. We're about 400 right now. Let's push to 1,000. Those numbers be climbing. We got like 15,000 people listening to this show on podcasts every month. Let's yeah. move some of that shit to YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you subscribe to our show at CraigCommy.com, you can be entered, be entered to win fat loot, so do it. Um, also, take time to check out our fellowship members there. If you are not check out Inner Party Conflict, Gabe and Jeff put on a fantastic show. The quality of their work and entertainment is the best. Um, I wish ours was as great as theirs. <laughs> like their quality is like just perfect. Um, also head on over and check out, uh, Lore Smith's content. Lore Smith is a great supporter of this show. He's been doing it for years and picking up a single one of his items, uh, and go a long way, him. honestly. Yeah. yeah. So, all right, that'll do it for the show today. I am your host, Justin. I'm your co-host, Austin. And I'm your co-host, Dan. Thanks for listening. Keep your blades sharp and spells prepared, heroes. (laughs) See you guys guys. later. Adios.